Hello, welcome to Mark Langley's Horsemanship Podcast, a podcast helping people to understand their horses better, to provide solutions in a calm, connected way. I'm Jenny Barnes. And I'm Mark Langley. Hi, Mark. You've just joined us from a six-day clinic. You've been uh, working here in New South Wales. Um, so six-day clinics are very, very popular um, for us. Um, you just take on six horses and you train them yourself for three days, each horse getting a fairly large chunk of your time. And then you spend the next three days helping the owner to transition with these changed horses. Um, and uh, we've been having having a great six days, uh, a, a lot of laughter and, and fun and um, getting to know all the people that have come along. We've got another six day clinic in just a couple of days time. And you um, just you love these clinics, don't you? They're sort of quite, quite, um, quite an opportunity for you to really get stuck in, roll your sleeves up and get stuck back into training. Yeah, well, it's, it, it's um, you know, when I travel around doing a lot of clinics, I'm, I'm doing a lot of teaching and, you know, you've got 10 students and you, they get all individual time. And the six-day clinic gives me a chance to really get out and be active for the whole day as well. I, I really like sort of, you know, once upon a time I've always been, you know, worked very hard and um, it's good to be able to get out and, and keep busy. And But it gives me a big chance to, to get into, you know, the bracing horses a bit more, really help them through um, and and do what I can do with the horse to help make a, a, a hopefully a longer lasting change in the horse. So when, when the person takes on the horse or takes on, you know, that horse to take home again, they've got through some sort of sticky areas that they can really sort of, you know, keep going with. And they're still taking on the philosophy because each person is watching every single lesson of every horse and then when you work through them, so they, you know, there's certain things that, you know, I'd like to say, and, and everybody can do what I can do. Everybody can do what I can do. That's, it's not that, you know, that what I do is anything special, but I have done a lot of horses and, you know, and, you know, if I put my, maybe if I put my mind to it, I could ski down a black slope uh, and, and, and look pretty smooth, but I'd never be as smooth as, as the, um, the, the kid that just skis down black slopes every time, you know, they started off as a kid, you know, I'd, I'd, but if I put my mind to it, I, c I could understand technique and I could do a reasonable job of it. Um, so there's things that I've, I've had experience with, with horses and stuff that I can really kind of get into and, and, and help and help someone through some real sticky spots. And then when the horse is on the other side of that brace, it's just a little easier for them to sort of, you know, keep them, keep them, you know, you know, going along and improving. Uh, so that's where six day clinics really, really good. Um, and then slowly but surely, the person, their skill sets evolve and and change, and and they get better and better. And then then the horse ticks along even better from there. That's great. So if you're interested in in uh, coming along to a six day clinic, so they are, like I said, they are super super popular. We're running more next year, 2024, and our clinic calendar is shortly going to be coming out that's when people can jump on and book on a clinic so and uh, once it comes out that is the time to do it because they do seem to fill for the year just in a, in a remarkably short space of time so uh, to make sure you don't miss out if you're interested and you want to keep an eye out on any of the clinics that mark runs you make sure you get our newsletters because that's where you'll hear it first and you can sign up for those from the website so just google mark langley and uh, check out make sure you put your email address in just click the um you know the sign up button and uh you'll just get the emails that will come through once they get released in a few weeks time so today mark i've got some questions for you these are from our online members and uh it's going to be a little bit of a mixed bag today but we've got some really interesting questions the first one um i think uh, particularly interesting is from jody and she's wondering if you might be able to talk to us about the relationship between lightness and softness you can have one without the other is that the case and what happens when you add speed to them you can yeah you can have one without the other but you can't have the other without one if that makes sense uh so so and what relationship to speed does that was that the, the, yep okay so mm. um Speed is speed is where some of this can all unfold, but I'll get to that in a second. But um, so lightness and softness. So lightness is um, there's a the, uh, some some years ago I, I did a little. Uh, it might have been when I used to do live question and answers when I first started doing these um, question and answers for the 
for the Facebook members and stuff. And I, I think I said um, a pillet piece of polystyrofoam is light but brittle, uh, so you can pick it up. It's easy to sort of lift and move around, but if you flex it or do anything with it, it can crack. Uh, whereas a, a cuddly, a light cuddly toy, you can squeeze it, you can manipulate it, and it's still light and but it's soft. Okay, so. Um, and that's how I see a lot of horses. The, the horses that, um, that are light generally carry a reasonable amount of brace. And if you put them in certain binds or pressure, they crack, their mind cracks and they, they, they're, they're carrying tension all the time and, and they sort of slowly unfold and things like that. So when we're training horses, it's, it's interesting because you've got to build up a certain amount of lightness and that comes through amount of uh, life and awareness, but you can have, life and awareness and still be carrying the level of anxiety that doesn't give you a soft mind, okay? So um, some time ago, um, Ross Jacobs wrote um, a bit of a blog on it and, and, and he said, um, yeah, you can have lightness without softness, but you can't have softness without lightness. And that's a really good way of putting it because um, – what 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 that's saying is a soft lightness obviously okay if you get one of those really calm sort of sleepy horses you won't have softness with a friendly calm horse it might be friendly and calm but softness is something that has a certain innate awareness where the horse is uh, seeking answers making decisions and searching and um you know easy to manipulate but being easy to manipulate is um, having a manipulated uh, lading frame, like a frame of mind that is taking on information, has good self-awareness, awareness of the environment, awareness of the different things around it. So um, that awareness comes with more of an awakeness in a horse and that energy and, and the energy in life to get a soft stop or a soft, uh, a soft transition, a nice forward transition all comes through a certain amount of energy life and awareness so so basically um a horse has to have that lightness and that responsiveness to to get softness you can't just be asleep and have softness so the horse has to be awake and sometimes when you wake up horses initially and you get a little bit of awareness and you get them sort of a little bit you know up to do something they'll be a little concerned a little worried not sure and that's where you get sort of a horse that's making a decision, but it's not truly soft. So basically what's happening is in some horses, like a really dead horse, I'll say, okay, I put my legs on. There's no response. The horse is, so I might have to do something to create awareness. So an example might be on a, just the last clinic, there was a horse that really struggled with leg transition. It was really good in the rain, starting to flow in the rain's nice, but it just learned to block out the legs. So... I put a belly rope on it and I did one kind of quick electric pull on that belly rope forward and it jumped and went, whoa, where'd that come from? And then it was worried. It was like, what do I do? So I had all this lightness but no softness because the horse was a bit anxious because I woke it, I woke the system up, I woke its awareness up and because it lacked answers and it didn't, it wasn't sure, it was, it was a bit worried. Um, so then... I, you know, the aim is to repeat that, like, okay, can you feel that? The horse goes, yeah. Can you feel that? The horse goes, yeah. And it starts to search. And when it searches in the right, an searches for the right answer, you might reward a little and say, that's the answer. And then it starts to follow the feel. And when the horse gets comfortable at carrying that life, carrying that awareness, and then it gets really good at understanding. And it's obviously provided through the clarity that we're offering it. It follows the feel and it goes, oh, this is easy. I'm following the feel. I'm thinking forward with that question or whatever if that question was to think forward to the feel of the belly rope I feel good about it I'm making a decision that my body's supporting and I'm not traumatized by you I'm not troubled by the pressure uh, but I'm still awake well that starts to when it turns into softness so if the horses if the pressure is encouraging the horse to um, act on its thoughts and make a decision that it feels good about um, and it's not troubled by any of that then that's, that's where that window of softness comes in, that window of opportunity for softness. If the horse just stays light, so I get a lot of horses at clinics that have been performance horses and they're very, very light, 
but they're just moving away from pressure and they're just waiting for that pressure to stop and they go, oh, thank God the pressure stopped. Oh, here's some more pressure. I've got to move away from it. And they carry the anxiety and they're not releasing the anxiety because the, the what they've got when the, the, they've got – so they, so what happens is the anxiety builds up and that's kind of building up that energy and awareness, I suppose, that builds up that um, – life that gives them the ability to be light but what happens is a light horse the energy the energy the 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 anxiety is staying up with the amount of energy and lightness the horse has so as the horse gets lighter and more energetic the anxiety rises with it so the whole time the horse is just carrying more anxiety as as it comes up and down and i find those horses are, are not letting the anxiety go whereas a soft horse uh initially maybe like when i s s talked about the belly rope the horse's uh, awareness and anxiety came up both together but as we repeated the lesson in a certain way the the awareness and life stayed where it needed to be but the anxiety level came down so the horse kept all that good stuff but got rid of the excess anxiety that that kept it troubled so so that's what what we're sort of um you know aiming for but um like a saying that i say to people is when you create pressure pressure is not a threat it's an opportunity and, and and in training horses when we create a pressure we have to have seen a thought change where the horse made a decision for itself that made it feel better to release that anxiety. And that's how you get that horse thinking. So every pressure is an opportunity, whereas a light horse, they just sometimes just see pressure as a threat and they've just got to try and find how they can get us to release the pressure. Um, so, um, and, the, and the question going into the impulsion side of it, um, the, usually the light horses, if most, all the light horses that I've ever had at a clinic that feel like, oh, they can go sideways, I can back up and I, they carry brace, their muscles are tight, they're, they're, they're kind of sometimes hypervigilant or they're just, just very bracy. They never carry true softness in their muscles. They don't know how to collect because they've kind of got tension in them. Um, so they do everything lightly, but there's no softness in their mind. So there's no softness in their body. Uh, so they don't loosen up. They don't pivot on their on their joints properly they're kind of you know they're, they're more likely to break down there's a whole bunch of things that sort of you know end up sort of w w why there's problems um but the soft horses uh so so the light horses uh that, that are kind of very responsive and they don't push on pressure they're just avoiding the pressure they tend to um when you bring the uh the, the speed up or the impulsion up they tend to get a little bit more worried because that as i say that anxiety is coming up with the speed and that's where the speed really really influences the 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 light horses in in a way that's really negative versus a soft horse if you keep them soft they can bring up the energy but because they're empowered to make their decisions and their decisions that they're comfortable with they're not frightened of us and the the guiding aids and stuff like that and they're making decisions for themselves then they can bring that energy up keep the right amount of awareness the energy comes up but the tension levels are still you know down in an area where that where maybe the walk would have been you know they're, they're still comfortable in their mind and body so um so the 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 worry doesn't come up with the speed um so that's so important so so what i say and like a lot of the horses like the one at the last clinic we did so much work previously also in online lessons with the reins with this particular horse that he wasn't so worried about the reins. He was getting very comfortable with the reins, and then soon enough, the rein speed got faster, and he could he could um, get with it quicker. And he wanted, and you know, he's you know. So basically, the more they understand at the slower speeds, the better they get at the slower speeds. The more the 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 when you speed it up, they're very confident, so they they can they can cope with it better. And that's that's really important to get true softness in the slower speeds, not just mediocre softness. You want a really good softness in the slow stuff, um, and then that softness will carry through into the speed. Okay, we're going to stay on the topic of speed. Um, Talia has a question uh, about her horse and how it behaves in the round pen. She can lunge her horse in there um, with a halter or without any tack at all. And she gets to the point where she's racing around and bucking. And Talia is fairly confident 
that a horse would run through her if she didn't move out of the way. So now she's mm-hmm. quite hesitant to actually work with her in there. She's just wondering, you know, what you would do in this situation. Okay. So I'll tell a little story, Talia, about um, Queen's, Queen's just in the recent clinic up in Queensland at Royal Ants Acres. Um, we were in the ar- undercover arena and there was a round yard that was not off the arena, but, but just, but just, a bit, bit out in the paddock there, where which we could see, and it seemed like on the weekends when the gisters come to work their horses, they put it in the round yard, and just about every horse that got put in the round yard was worried, but just about every person did the same thing with it. The round yard was a place of um, moving the horse away from pressure and getting it to travel around in a circle. It seemed like that was the norm. So, you know... I would just call the round yard a goldfish bowl for those horses because all they did was just run around going, I'm looking to the outside going, I don't really want to be in here. And some horses and your horse, you've had, maybe had it all your life. Maybe you haven't, maybe it's got a history. They have bad experiences in round yards. So when they get in one and you add energy, it kind of gets worse and they get to a sort of a, a panic uh, sort of mode where they're actually very threatened because basically driving energy into a horse is saying I'm chasing, you know, basically. So we have to be very careful how we do it or find alternatives to doing it. So if that is the thing that you're asking your horse to do as I'm moving you away and your horse is traumatized by driving energy and there's no way out because that fence just keeps coming around and around and around, there's like, like you know, Groundhog Day, deja vu, the horse, the horse has no way out then it's going to get a little frantic and it's going to sort of start so that yeah then they start to kind of like you know they'll run through things and stuff like that because they're they're not really centered they're making very bad decisions and they're in a high flight mode so um some people would avoid a round yard and say i just won't work my horse in a round yard i'd start to question you know really and look at how you're operating your horse, how softly she's making decisions, how you are uh, getting her to follow or feel out on a circle, things like that. I'd really look at, uh, is she going towards her thoughts or am I just pushing her away? Really look at those things. Ask her to walk softly around you first, then just let her just dribble out to the end of a lead and then come back and maybe let her go out. And instead of doing circles, maybe send her out to the end of the lead and come back and then send her out softly and come back and then just stop for a bit. Um, don't use the round yard as a place of I'm going to send you away from pressure and that'd be your, that be and then it's a lunging kind of place because maybe that's what she's really frightened of. And then if she's travelling soft, she's going to be more aware, she's going to be softer, she's going to trust you more, trust pressure more, and then you won't have that she's going to run over you. So I'm not going to tell you how to stop her from running over you. I want to try and figure out how we can get her not to be so traumatised in a round yard that she's going to get to that stage. And then if she's still a horse that, you know, comes up to you and she doesn't have self-awareness or awareness of the things around you, you can just, you know, walk around a paddock or a yard or something and every time you stop and you feel her energy just coming into you, you can do something like bang your leg and she'll go, oh, there you are, and then she'll stop and just get get to her to have more sort of awareness of you and, and her surroundings when she's um just in, in general situations. Don't necessarily do it in the round yard, just do it everywhere and, and just have that a normal thing that she understands where you are. Um, there's certain expectations and she understands your bubble and stuff like that and just have that really, really clear. And then if you can get her to learn how to feel safe around pressure uh, and, and, and carry energy with pressure without getting traumatised, then, then then that round yard will be a good experience. But maybe see if there's any things in there that you're just kind of sending away and just sending her around. Take those tools away. Don't use those tools. Ask her to go in a different way. And that might mean you've got to t- teach her to lead better. It might take you a little while. But, you know, online we've got lots of leading lessons, lots of uh, op- um, alternatives to, to driving horses out that are, are really helpful. And then once she sees things in a different way and we're doing things in a different way she'll actually start to trust us a lot more trust her decisions a lot more and then that frantic running around and stuff will be a thing of the past because she won't go into that um flight mode because we're not driving her and chasing her so um chasing a horse without freedom to get away can make them quite frantic and that's why round yards make them more frantic is because there's no way out from that driving pressure 
So if this has raised them, um, you know, your eyebrows, if you're interested in what Mark's talking about, and this is uh, a little bit new to you and you're listening to this podcast, um, this is this is a big part of what Mark teaches is these uh, providing alternatives to, to, to ways that, you know, really don't put horses in a good mental state. So we're sort of trying to avoid that. We want to keep horses in a really nice learning frame of mind. And, uh, and that comes down to us big time. So uh, what we do affects them. And there are plenty of ways that we can really manipulate that to our advantage. Because at the end of the day, when a horse is learning, we can get more out of them and we can make progress a lot better. And softness comes into it far easily, far more easily. So um, Talia, you're on the uh, membership. There's um, If you want to dive into the psychology behind all of this, um, you know, there are videos on that. And sing out if you can't find them. I'm very happy to send you some links. Um, all right. The next question marked for you is from Bianca. And she's just been to one of your recent clinics up in Queensland. She's been working with Floss. She's been doing backing up on the ground under saddle and following the feel of a rain, letting her to get let go of a strong thought and all sorts of other things. Um, she's doing well at, with most of it. And sometimes she's lovely and soft, but then sometimes she's finding that she just blocks her out and digs her heels in. What she's wondering is, should she just keep repeating these exercises or should she be adding in some new exercises now? Does she just need to be a little bit more patient and keep persisting until she's soft and light all of the time? She'd just love to know your feedback on this and what to do next. Um, all sounds good, actually. Uh, you know, like feeling the mare when at the clinic and knowing what she's like. Um, it was really, really important that things were clear with her. So, you know, what I mean by clear is it, there weren't three things happening at once and each one of those things she was making a mediocre decision to and those things were sort of getting her to bottle up anxiety. So, so you know, we did a lot of, you know, basic like let go of that thought, follow the left rein, follow the right rein, follow the feel of the legs. Alternatively, not, not, not together. So she was making a good decision to each one of those singular things and, until she was... Um, getting more comfortable and carrying less brace in, in each one of those individual things. So and I think that was the biggest thing is making everything that you're doing very individual to what she needed to, like the lowering of the head. Like I, I, I did trouble her a little bit. I, wor I, I worried her with the flag a bit and she went to her normal, oh, and then I said, but follow this instead until she could soften so she had coping mechanisms under pressure so she could uh, follow or feel softly when there was something she wasn't sure about. But that was also showing her as well that when there's scary things, it's not always directed at her. It's just scary things happening around her so she doesn't have to be uh, fully influenced by those things. Um, so basically what I'm thinking and by, by what you've written is I think um, she's improving and she's getting better at each one of those things that you might have a maybe 70 80% positive transition ratio which but sometimes she gets a little emotional and fights but you've got to remember she's been a horse has you know had a lot of fight for a long time and carried a lot of tension in a lot of situations so the fact that she's getting pretty good at improving and she's getting better and better it might mean stay consistent keep working on those things until you're getting 100 percent accuracy in the positive transitions like even if it's just a left range she's just done a hundred turns to the left and not one of them being negative so it's not that oh well i've done one turn and it's good that's a hundred percent two turns good at a hundred percent as well but if you did 50 without a negative one you go she's getting better so there could be a little more clarity needed like i think you know maybe maybe there's some areas where there's a bit of vagueness uh, and and when she's not not worried about something exterior that you can't control she feels pretty good but with a bit of vagueness when there's something else worrying her she might be getting a bit worried and that's where you get those little spikes that this this time it wasn't right but I, I'm, I'm i'm thinking that keep up with the consistency and add a lot of good repetitions together until it becomes a habit you know it becomes a habit that she doesn't know the other side but she because she's like you've got to think she's always going to tap into an old memory because it's so strong in her of pressure's a, a problem pressure's a threat pressure's a trap um and and that will still be in here it just doesn't disappear so by doing lots of positive transitions repeating those um 
it becomes a habit that that becomes that the only habit she knows is to accept pressure and follow the feel in a soft way. And she, she'll sort of slowly get so good at that, that, um, those other things will disappear. Um, if, as I say, but you've got to keep, you know, clarity, you can be, you can do a thousand transitions and if it's not clear, uh, then, then, then you could be a thousand times worse. But I think if you're making steady progress, you're probably on the right path. Just maybe in a week, a month, you know, have another re-look at it and see if she's, you know, improved. And you might find that just the good repetitions are becoming the the new her and the new memory and the new habit. And and uh, yeah, she'll 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 just you know continue to get better. Uh, if she started to regress um then we might have to have another look at it and go okay what's happening what are you doing specifically and um you know work out on the specifics there might be something that you might be starting to kind of do in a certain way that needs to be adjusted and make those adjustments um to get some more clarity so uh, yeah um but at the moment just work on maybe more repetitions will make a better habit but if things are regressing and you're sort of all you're treading water, we might have to look at some sort of adjustments on the specific things that you're asking and, and, and what's happening. Okay, and the last question for today is from Beth, and it's about her horse called Badger. Um, he's been living in on adjustment with 10 horses on 20 acres for about six months. He's very, very happy there. Used to have itch and now he's glowing but she's going to move him onto four acres with two other horses. So he'll just be in a herd of three. And her question is, is that likely to undo all of the good that she's done? Yeah, I don't know, Beth. Um, I don't know. You can only do it and find out. Um, there is a chance that he, if he's, if he's happy, in a big herd means there's enough horses in that herd to give him horse friends that he likes and he's comfortable with. So something in the dynamics of that herd has made him a happy horse if it's cleaned up his coat a bit and, you know, he's just just more generally a, a healthier, happier horse. It means there's a reason, two reasons. is the bigger bigger paddock, the more variety in pasture and food might be good for his body, but the um, the emotional stimulant of having a bigger herd and and uh, things happening and comfort, friends to scratch, all that sort of stuff has obviously been a big bonus for him. Um, so stripping him from that, you you know, there's moving horses around like moving kids around. You're con you're going to be you. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You're going to be interrupting their comfort and making a change that they have to suddenly adjust to. And some horses don't adjust very well. Some horses are very good adjusters depending on, you know, their, their level of confidence and, and their life, you know, from the past, all sorts of things. So um, maybe if he's turned into a happy, soft horse around other horses, maybe the smaller group of horses he's with will fit the bill and be good horses to be around and he'll feel comfortable. There might be just the right dynamics of horses that suit his personality and he might just settle in fine. So he could just settle in fine. He might end up frantic because there's maybe they want him to be the kind of leader and because, you know, they're all bit bit messed up themselves and he gets a bit frantic or who knows. It's very hard to know what's going to happen in that new herd. And um, so it could go either way, Beth. It, it, it's going it's to disrupt him. So there will be a uh, certain trauma and worry in it. So it's gonna, there's going to be a disruption. It's going to be sort of, you know, certain stress in it. But... Once he gets through those other horses, within two or three days, he might look like, like happy as Larry or he could be kind of stressed and start to, you know, everything starts to deteriorate and regress, but you won't know it until you do it. Uh, if you have to do it, you have to do it. At least you've got to put him with other horses and, and there's a bit of room to move about. Um, and if he's already in a better frame of mind, sometimes going into a new environment will go into it better. So that, that hopefully will come into play. But... Um, yeah, there's going to be an uncertainty and I, 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 I can't necessarily answer it with a heap of clarity. I can say, yes, there will be a stress in changing because you're stripping away from something he's got comfortable with and that'll disappear. Um, if the horse dynamics in the new herd work for him and he's comfortable with them, it might be just fine. The other thing is food, you know, the availability of food 
on a broader uh, on a bigger area is great for horses because they don't have that oh, i've got to wait for food all that sort of stresses you know I'm, oh you know there's there's plenty of pasture out there to graze on so they're a lot happier like that too so if it's like a four acres it's you know they've got to wait till feed time and stuff there's also a stress in that so that's another complication that you've got to think about which you, you might have to sort of work on is you know can i have have a, a, a available food in that paddock you know good good you know big hay feeder that the horses can go back to and there's always that there and stuff like that to help help with it so things like that you can look at but but yeah who's to say he, he might just settle in uh the dynamics might be bad and it might be stressful for him but you won't know until you do it um but yeah just monitor it and then maybe let us know in a little while and see see what's happening and then we see if we can make some adjustments or very good. Thank. Good luck with that, Beth. I, ho I hope it works out well for you. And thank you, Mark, to all those questions. Thank you to the members for your questions that have come through again. And uh, uh, appreciate all of the knowledge that you, you keep giving us, Mark. It's really good. And we'll be back again soon. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, everybody. You can learn more from Mark and his approach online through his online training videos. Just search Mark Langley Horsemanship. Join hundreds of others around the world making real progress, fixing problems and improving their relationship with their horses. There are now over 500 training videos. Make use of the seven day free trial and take a look. Membership is just $15 a month and you get to ask Mark a question.